Sarah Jackson, and I'm part of the Tall Grass Prairie Center. Very happy to have you all here. And uh, for the last uh, uh, seminar of our Restoration and Management Seminar Series. And so, um, but before we get started with that, a, a couple of uh, plugs, since the, the, that's sort of the theme here. Is the, uh, um, there is a plant sale at the Botanical Center at UNI on April 26th. Uh, any of you been to the UNI plant sale before? No. Okay, a few of you. So um, but what you need to know about the plant sale is that it starts at 7.30 a.m. and if you get there at 8, you won't get what you want necessarily. <laughs> People come early and they get uh, a lot of good deals and wonderful plants there, native and non-native. So that's at the UNI Botanical Center on April 26th, that's a Thursday. And um, some of the proceeds go to the Student Nature Society, so that's good. Um, and so, uh, and the public is, is invited to that, so uh, put that on your calendar. Um, this is the fourth of our four seminars for the spring semester of 2018. And uh, I want to thank the friends of the Tallgrass Prairie Center for uh, helping to support this seminar series, and we're very grateful for that support, and we um, have really loved the, the camaraderie and, the, and the, uh, being able to bring everybody in for this seminar series. So now that the weather is warming up and it's time to be outside planting, uh, we won't have any more seminars until next winter. However, um, hope to see you in September. Early in September is, I, is a Prairie Heritage Week, and we'll be having some events during Prairie Heritage Week. So if you are already on our mailing list, you'll receive an announcement of that. And, and, um, that tends to coincide with the monarch uh, uh, migration, so that's, that's always fun. All right, well, um, with, those, uh, with those out of the way, let's introduce our featured guest speaker, Dan Mays. Dan is a native plant enthusiast, and that is putting it mildly. Uh, he's a freelance writer and a lifetime master gardener from Walcott, Iowa, and uh, he believes in extensively utilizing native plants in the urban landscape. He's done a lot of urban rain gardens and um, a lot of other uh, a, a lot of other urban um, uh, landscaping, and um, he's just got a lot. Uh, he's just learned a lot and uh, is is here to tell us what he's learned, and uh, I'm very excited to have him here. Thank you, Dan. Okay, well, thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Nice turnout. Uh, here, a lot of you are master gardeners. We've got a bunch of them in the, yeah. Well, I am one, too, but so what, huh? You didn't come to really hear about that. What I'm going to do, i will give you a little of my background. I, I'm... Uh, I'm an electrician at John Deere Davenport Works. That's, what I, that's how I put groceries on the table. But what I've been extensively involved in native plants, I got started almost 20 years ago extensively on it. And what I started when rain gardens started to become mentioned, I decided that was a good thing to do. I was building a new house. And so then I started talking about rain gardens. Well, they always usually suggest you plant native plants. And I'm not a believer in going out there shooting out my mouth telling you what you ought to do when I haven't done it myself. So I really dove into this head first. And so you're going to hear about 20 years worth of experience here on the native plants. And I do a lot of things that a lot of the professionals won't tell you about. I'll tell you about my mistakes, number one. Um, but also it'll, um, um, I come at it from a little bit of a different angle than probably you're familiar with. And one angle, I, I want to get this straight right away, I don't want to offend anybody, but in an urban setting, it's different than it is out in the back 40 where certainly the tall grass prairie has done most of their work is on larger areas. And one of the big things there is diversity. And in, in a small urban environment, sometimes diversity can be a real enemy for you. So you've got to be a little careful there. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. But I call diversity, I mean, I'm talking about design. That's what makes it work in the urban landscape. I'm not talking about the people who work here. I'm talking about Joe and June public out here that you've got to deal with. So anyway, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as things go. So we'll get started into it. 
Um, whoops, I better turn on my little pointer. Come on, baby. Let's hope. God. Uh, uh, it's on, yeah. Well, let's just do it this way. <laughs> okay, well, the question is, you know, I mean, you learned about native plants, and most people are, landscaping is overwhelming. And they really, you know, they're really reticent. As, I can't do landscaping doing very well anyway. Now you want me to put native plants in there? So I know it kind of overwhelms people. I kind of got a, a slide that shows. Is that kind of how you feel? Yeah. So, and so I can, you know, I can relate to that. Anyway, I start out with this was not a trick question. What do you see here? It's just a little line drawing of a guy with a beard and that. Nothing, nothing, nothing trick about it. But let's take a little bit closer look. You see more details? That's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to try and take a little bit of closer look at what's really happening in an urban landscape. Remember the key word here is urban. Um, so anyway, we're going to try and look at some of that. Um, and of course, I usually start off with the first law of gardening. The only thing that two gardeners ever agree on is what the third one's doing wrong. <laughs> okay. And the second law of gardening and you master gardeners should certainly know the answer to this. Every answer to a gardening question should begin with, well, that depends. <laughs> and, it, and it does depend. It depends on site conditions, all kinds of different things. But anyway, in, in other words, my big thing is, you know, you, you read these articles in the newspaper, and it's written by somebody who was actually sitting up in their high-rise apartment in New York City telling me what I had a plan out here in Iowa. It just doesn't work very well. But then again, they probably shouldn't take advice from me on what to do up there. Okay, and of course, then I, I come up with my own law of gardening. I figured we've got to have one. Garden advice is like picante sauce. Neither one should come from New York City. <laughs> okay, so let's try and get local advice. You know what? You know, let, in other words, let's plant what grows here. Duh. And the natives, you know, that, that grow here. That's what we're really interested in. I'm going to try. Oh, that's working. All right. A lot of the problem is that at least on a subconscious level, that most of us have learned, think we've learned, how to garden from the British. And let, the British have wonderful gardens. There's no denying it. But of course, theirs are a lot different. Most people don't realize that really their gardens are not made to be viewed at ground level where we view ours. They're meant to be on their, what they call the, the first floor is actually what we would call the second story. So they're meant to be looked down on. You can see those geometric patterns. And also realize that they have a staff. Now, I don't know about any of you, but Danny does not have a staff to do the gardening, you know? If I don't do it, it don't get done. So anyway, so there's a lot of difference. And we try and, you know, we think, oh, that's a standard we're supposed to try and strive to. You're not going to do it. Let's not try. Besides that, we got a lot of stuff going for us here in the Midwest that they can't even touch. And of course, they like our plants. This is one of our native, this is Cambridge University, where they have a staff that takes care of this. And of course, this is Virginia creeper, which they plant there. It looks, in the fall, it gets bright, brilliant red. It's gorgeous. I do not recommend planting this on a building at all. It'll go in your windows, under the roof, every little crack and current. But of course, once again, we have a staff that takes care of that. So it's OK. However, what I do like to do, I like to try and at least encourage people when I go out and talk, especially about rain gardens, I want you to plant just one native plant. If you don't have any, get started with one. And this is the one that I really recommend. It gets brilliant red in the fall, but it cl climbs up through the trees. All you really need to do, you, you just say, well, I don't want a lot of work or do all that. Well, just dig a little hole beside there, put it in, water it for a few weeks, get it established, and you can pretty much forget about it. It scampers up through the trees. It looks gorgeous. It gets a lot brighter red than this picture shows. Um, but like, especially if you got some open trees like walnuts or, or um, uh, Kentucky coffee trees or other ones, they just, oh, they're fabulous. So and that's, that's a native plant that, you know, is an easy peasy one. You just can't fail with it. And of course, uh, here's the green leaves. And then, you know, if you plant that stuff, you might get something like that shows up, starts to munching on them. 
and then you get something like that. And I think that's cool. <coughs> that's the you know Virginia creeper sphinx moth. And I think that is really cool to be able to look at, show your kids or your grandkids. But you know what? If you don't have those plants that they feed on, I mean, that's a native insect, and duh, they eat native plants. So if you don't have the native plants, they won't come. And of course, that leads into some other things. I mean, here we have another example. You know, Gallardia, you know, the Indian blanket flower. But of course, and then you get some cool looking moths. But you know, that's what they feed on. That's what they lay their eggs on. That's a little caterpillar. They're laying like silk, and then they pull the, the petals together. But you start seeing other things that come along with this, with native plants. Let me translate to you what the, in the garden centers, they always talk about clean foliage. Oh, this is clean foliage. Translated, in other words, nothing's chewing on it. It means that stuff tastes so nasty, you know, bug will even put it in its mouth. <laughs> well, but they feed on natives. And the thing that, the reason that's important is because if you like, a lot of people like birds in their yard. Well, the birds won't nest in your yard if they don't have feed for their babies. Where do they feed them? Well, caterpillars, insects, and everything. So if you want the birds, you gotta have the insects. To have the insects, you gotta have the native plants. And of course, that leads into this, this book by Talamy, uh, Doug Talamy. And here he's coming here, I don't know, in a few months or something. If you haven't, or Cedar Rapids, I think, was an event sponsored by the Tallgrass Prairie Center, or roadside management people. But anyway, if you haven't seen Doug tell him, by all means do it. But he goes into really why you need to. And of course, then he talks about uh, the chickadees. And they're feeding, it takes like 5,000 of those little, you know, uh, caterpillars per clutch of hatchlings. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And they've timed them going back and forth. But the thing it is, if you don't have the, the native plants here, and it can be oak trees, whatever, but you won't have the insects to feed them. And if they can't feed their babies, they won't be there. I have noticed, I haven't done a, you know, a uh, scholastic, you know, study, but I've noticed in my yard, I get a lot more birds nesting and, uh, you know, showing up in my yard than other people who also have extensive gardens, but they use a lot of the horticultural ones. The native plants draw that, the insects in and uh, they bring the birds in as well. In landscaping design, what we really want to concentrate on more than like the entire, you know, my entire yard, I want you to first think, you know, in smaller bits. You know, how do you eat an elephant a bite at a time? Well, the same way with landscaping, you can do it with portions. In other words, they talk about the, you know, your favorite place you sit in a chair or maybe your front porch seat. In other words, wherever you spend a lot of time at, as you look straight out, you really kind of see in a cone. And, and that's the area where you see is what you really ought to concentrate on first. You know, why worry about over here behind, you know, on the side of the garage that you never really see too much? In other words, these are the first places you want to concentrate. And so develop those little areas. Um, and of course, in your, you know, I'm talking about check out the different views. It could be, you know, the, the, always the default one, they say, well, when you're doing the dishes at the kitchen sink, you know, what do you see out there? Or maybe a picture window. I always like the expression, why not when we look out a picture window instead of a lot of times we'll have a one tree plopped right in the dead center, why don't we create a picture out there for a picture window? And in that cone of vision, why don't we put something nice out there? And that's what I did, I, certainly for my wife when we built a house. We took those things into consideration. Uh, just different viewpoint, whoopsie. Um, here is one, just a small example. This is in our sunroom. I don't claim this would be a great photo. But a lot of times we eat our Sunday brunch out here in the morning. And right, you know, back in here, you can see, barely see some utility boxes. And I hated sitting there in the morning looking at them dumb things. So I decided to cover them up. So what I did, I, there's like a native viburnum. Here's a native hazelnut redbud tree, but I planted some stuff there that I don't have to look at it. Particularly when it's, I had to take this when the leaves had, had fallen. But, uh, you know, we, we love it, you know, when it gets real cold. Then, of course, my wife has her uh, amaryllis collection. Those aren't native. <laughs> but uh, we, she does enjoy I, She loves them, and I've bought her amaryllis every year that we've gone together. So, 
anyway, that's you know pushing 30 years here. But uh, anyway, I did cover up that bad scene. A lot of times in landscape design, we think, oh, we want to make it pretty. Sometimes your effort is best spent by eliminating something bad, something ugly. And like in the case of those utility boxes, I thought they were kind of ugly. And so I just concealed them, and I concealed them with native plants. I could have planted a lot of other stuff. I could have you know, put a burning bush or something that I know later the birds will take and drop over the woodlands, and now I got stuff crowding out everything. But I, I chose native plants. Uh, think about creating a theater view. Let me translate this. What amounts to, on a theater, we usually have like a main character, maybe two, or, but you have essentially a main character. Then you might have some minor characters. You got some props and this and that. I want you to think about when you're developing this cone vision out here, have a main character, something that is really impressive. Uh, and that's what um, will focus most of your attention on. But we'll have other things that make it look better. We're trying to frame and amplify the view of that particular plant. Or it might be a piece of artwork, maybe a statue or something. Um, but anyway, think of it in, because you really need those other minor characters, even though they may not have a lot of wow factor, they add to it a lot. You can frame your views with them. And we'll have other examples of that here. Uh, this is just a picture of a small rain garden. It doesn't have to be big. Most of those are native plants. I don't even know where this picture was, was from. It's just a, just a small little plant where they got to start, uh, start on native plants. So let's plant something. Here's a project I started on. I did a, out in a little town of Durant, Iowa, I did a, a rain garden there beside their fire station. And that was stuff that I, I propagated a bunch of plugs and had other plants and pots. And what I do, I grow a lot of different uh, native plants. I collect seeds and plant this and that, but I just give them away. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to sell plants. I'm trying to get the public involved. I'm trying to get somebody to grow one plant. And if they think it's a cool plant, they're ooh and on about it. I say, well, here, I'll give you one. Why don't you plant it? If I get it going, I'm trying to, you know, get a little um, movement happening here. Um, because, you know, we don't all have a big roadside we can plant, and we don't have, all have a, you know, uh, you know, 70 acre patch in the back that we could do, dedicate to that. But, you know, if I can get a, a small start on things, because you know what, those people, even though it may be on a small scale, they vote. And sometimes for the bigger projects, we need their vote. I don't want to create enemies, I want to create friends. So anyway, this was a one, and um, I want to also point out here, there's that baby. If you haven't done this yet, it's the best tool you ever had. Get a, a battery operated drill, get a good one. And then there's a ball bogger on the end of it. You can go along and just drill your holes. If you need a bigger, like a bigger size for a bigger pot, like a gallon pot, you can take it and water it around the hole. It speeds it up, it's so fast, takes the effort out of it. And also, one thing I like about it, I can get out there and I can kind of what I call cheat a little. If it's really too wet, if you go out there with a spade or something, you get a big ball of muck. Uh, this will it just kind of lightly fluff it as it brings it out. And then you can plant while it's still really too wet, gently fill it in, water it, and it'll be just fine. But it will save you time. I remember there was one time my wife and I, we went out planting some kind of bulbs. But we planted like 1,200 bulbs in like a half an hour. It just choom, 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 just drill drop, drill drop. So, I mean, it's really fast and it's easy. I had a neighbor lady who had back surgery, great gardener. She's got an extensive garden, but she couldn't bend down for a while. So what she did, she had her husband put an extension bit on that auger, and she just kind of, she had her kid with her. She kind of stood up here and drilled, you know. All right, you throw that in that hole. So, but they take the, they make it easy. And ladies, when it comes up, Father's Day is coming up, you say, sweetheart, I love you so much. I bought you this really great battery drill. And of course, you know, you got the ball bogger too, and he's happy and you get to use it, so. All right, so anyway, most of the time, a lot of times I plant plugs, and you can see the size of them. Everybody asks, well, what, what, what do you get? This one happened to be from Ion Exchange, it doesn't matter where. A lot of times I grow my, I, you know, save their 
little cell packs and they grow, you know, plant them like they, they grow like banshees, but the roots are focused down rather than a regular round pot where they go around and around, you have encircling roots. Uh, but a lot of times that's what I plant. Here's just showing, uh, sometimes I can't, maybe the conditions aren't right or like sometimes I got a project, I know it's coming up in the future, so I'll get plants in early, so I'll just pot them up in gallon pots for a while and uh, carry them over. Real fancy setup, huh? It works. Okay, and here, okay, Master Gardeners. I don't know who this is. I think these are Iowa Master Gardeners. But this one just, I saw this and drove me nuts. They say, yep, we, and we engineered this. I talk about over-engineering. And planting native plants and rain gardens, look, this ain't rocket science. You know, pretty much, you know, the brown part goes down, the green part goes up. You know, let's not overcomplicate it. But, you know, you know, can you imagine trying to walk around? I, I can't imagine wasting all the time. I could have had probably the whole thing planted in the time it took them to lay out their strings. Okay, that's enough of my rant there. <laughs> all right, let's go on to better things. But anyway, let's not overcomplicate this stuff. I know there's engineers. I work with engineers all day long at John Deere, and they're, you know, sometimes they think obviously differently than most people. So, and we need them. I'm not mean mouth. I'm just saying, time and a place. Here's this little garden I was talking about, a little rain garden out beside. This is the fire, well, ambulance, fire department, a little, you know, any town, you know, USA. But anyway, it's just a shallow depression. What I did, I had to move the rain gutter, or the gutters, downspouts here, and it just runs across the lawn. You can see a little bit of washing there. And what I, some of the, and did I, yeah. And here's kind of important, the date. It was in the first part of June is when I threw that stuff in the ground. And then some of the stuff, you know, these are the plugs are pretty small. I got a quarter there to show you that it's not very big. And this is one of the, my favorite little plants. And even Laura and I were mentioning, that, talking this before uh, in the day. But it's one that I really recommend. If you haven't planted this little one, a wild petunia, it's not a true petunia. But Ruellia humilis, it is, it's a little wild plant. It's a super performer, blooms the first year. It doesn't fall into that old loop, you know, about the, uh, the perennial, you know, the first year they, they sleep, second year they creep, third year they leap. This baby gets with it the first year, pumps out blooms. Uh, it's just a delightful little, little plant. Um, and it, just another shot. I mean, how do you beat that? You know, and it blooms for quite a long time. Uh, and they will self sow. They'll kind of they they swing their seeds over. Uh, they're what they're called explosively dihiscent. In other words, I found it one time. I was cleaning them in my sunroom one I don't know, February day, and it was like sun was shining on them. All of a sudden, I got you know stuff hitting my glasses. And I, what the? Well, anyway, it was them seeds. Yeah, they were, and I looked it up then because I didn't you know never messed with those seeds before, and they, that's what they said, explosively dihiscent. Uh, it'll be, it doesn't get really tall, very tall usually. Sometimes the seed will be about that. It's a low, low ground, it's a nice edger, and uh, it can even, you, you can find it too growing in, uh, it'll fling seeds, it'll even grow in your grass. You know, if you don't want it, you can, you know, take it out, but uh, it'll self-sow some, but I've never seen it be thuggish and like really try and be a mess. Um, tough plant. I've seen it growing in uh, the Rochester Cemetery where it's really sandy soil uh, and I've seen it in the section they had some people they're, they're, they buzz the grass down to about a half inch tall all year long and I still see it trying to grow in a tough plant uh, but a wonderful plant. Here's just another portion of that rain garden some of the stuff I planted great blue lobelia, Joe pie weed and of course butterfly milkweed uh, one that I really recommend is, I've only got a small picture of it, usually it's, it's a mass of blooming wine cups, Calaroia and Valucrata, another what I call wild plant. Wild plants are when a visitor comes to my garden and is walking along and goes, wow, what's that? That's a wild plant. I want those in my garden. And these, they all, you can grow them uh, a couple different ways that I grow them. I grow them like cascading down uh, a rock embankment. And also, they'll, I'll just let them scamper amongst the uh, different plants. And they'll kind of wind their way through there and just be blooming. 
And I love to take them bunches with my wife. I'll, I'll cut a bunch of those blossoms and I'll float them in a little glass bowl. Just wonderful. But that's one uh, um, I really recommend. And of course, another one that I, I sedges, I, I, this is one of my favorite sedges, and I love to pronounce this. It, it just rolls off your tongue, you know, the botanical. Carex muskinguensis. Okay, it's from the Muskingu, Muskingu River in Ohio was where it was first described. Uh, and that's where that muskingu part comes from. But anyway, it's uh, virtually evergreen, like late in the winter, like right now, if you hadn't buzzed it back or burned it off, it might look a little ratty on the ends, but it's, it stays green through almost all of the winter. It always looks, I think, great. It doesn't spread a lot. It will hold. I planted it to hold an embankment of berm in one of my rain gardens, so I didn't want it to wash out. It's, I've had it in the same spot for over 15 years. Uh, and here, this is, remember, we started in June, so June, July, August, September. This is that little rain garden with the native plants in bloom. Uh, and of course, here is those, that's how tall those little uh, wild petunias get. I was really tickled with that for the first year, you know, I was, because this was my old hometown. I knew all the city fathers were sitting there in judgment. They were waiting for Danny to screw up. I wasn't going to give them the pleasure, you know. So anyway, I did a lot of things there to, to make it look pretty. It's native plants because of the problem, and of course, we had, I had to fight them a little bit, or not fight them, but their, their first concerns, well, we don't want some weed patch there. Well, it doesn't have to be. Unfortunately, what usually gets people in that weed patch scenario is diversity. What they try and do is they get a seed mix, they scatter it out there, and it's what I call scrambled egg design. In other words, just beat it up, throw it around. There's no design to it at all. Subconsciously, in an urban environment, what we're looking for is order. And if you cr give them something that makes sense, logical sense, and some structure to it, it's acceptable. And a lot of what we do is on a subconscious level. Now, do you want to do that out, you know, in a 40-acre site? Heck no. But like I said, it's different once you come in town. Okay, you're not dealing with a farmer that's a half mile down the road. You're dealing with a bunch of neighbors that are right there and a bunch of, you know, people who, you know, it's their business to make your business their business. So, Questions? yeah. How many different plants are in there? Uh, I want to, I'm going to guess about 25. I, I, you know, I don't, I just started picking and saying, I can't, kind of what I did too, I, I put in what I, what I had available. And those are all stuff out of, that I had propagated was setting in pots, ready to go, so. Um, and there's some other stuff that, you know, that's grown up. I, there's, I know there's some hazelnut in there that hasn't, doesn't really show up yet. And a button bush is in there. And then also I have, you know, some stuff that's on the backside, the rose mallow. God, that's one of our native plants, and, and why aren't more people using this? What a beauty, you know? Um, here's an in situ site, this is, uh, that's in a wetland. I think that's uh, cord grass where it's growing in. I think that is. And uh, but anyway, just a, a beautiful one of our native plants, and most people have never seen it. You know, and I used to see it all the time. It's really out in the Mississippi River in the middle in the islands. There's a bunch of islands, but a lot of it grows there in some of the shallow water areas. But uh, another one, um, just point this out for in, in situ means in the site where you naturally find it. Uh, this is one called Marsh Marigold, and in this site, where right, it's a little wet prairie outside of town, um, outside of the town of Walcott. But they're in there; they're slugging it out with everything. They're competing with all the other plants, and they do grow there. They've been there for years and years. But if you bring them into a, a, a little bit more of an urban site, more of a garden type environment, they really perk up, and you know, and they look just gorgeous. Now, not all of not all the native plants. Some of the native plants, you know, you bring them into a rich environment, they just flop. But some of these excel, and you know, when you get them, you know, in a little bit different environment where they're not having to battle it with everything. But those, are, of course, are early bloomers, and uh, delightful, you know. And nobody, they've been here for centuries, and nobody's seen them. But I, once again, when they walk by, wow, what's that? 
that's the kind of plants I want. I mean, how do I, you know, how do I get so many different things? And you know, they say, where do you come up with all these different plants? You know, well, they've been here for centuries. It's just nobody else is planting them. This isn't like the newest and latest greatest development in the plant world. It's just, you know, you're going back, you know. All right, another one of my rants. I'll try and keep it short. Okay, most, most misunderstood element in landscape design is color. And I say banish the color wheel. Oh, my God. There's more time wasted in the garden on the color. And, you know, oh, let's ma oh these are complementing colors. That's nonsense. And here's why it's nonsense. As soon as you cross the threshold of whatever building you're in, the light, you're dealing with daylight or sunlight. And what does it do? Is the color of light in the early morning the same as it is at noon? No, it constantly changes. And we all know that, you know, if you go to pick out paint in, uh, underneath the you know, fluorescent lights, you're not going to get a true color that it's going to look like in your house. So they want the daylight. But anyway, that light, the color, the direction, the type, cloudy, you know, partly cloudy, you know, direct, what, uh, the spring lights, different than the summer light, different than the fall light. So in other words, and color is light. So in other words, exactly what color have you got? You know, it changes. You know, what time of day? You know, what are the other conditions? But, I, you know, there's certain things I do in that if there's, like, areas, like when I leave, or I know that certain areas I'm going to leave early in the morning to go to work or maybe get home later at night in the evening, the twilight hours, I'll try and plant some blue flowers there because they just sparkle. They're like little neon lights, the blue, because the light is blue. Now, in the middle of the day, hmm. But in our Midwestern sun is also a lot harsher than a lot of other areas of the country. Um, you know, and, and if you pick out this real pretty, oh, it's pretty pastels. Oh, I got this all, all picked out. i tell you what, at noon, all your pastels look like used Kleenex. <laughs> you know, so let's not, there's better things to sp spend your time on than worrying about the color wheel. Now, if you're picking out wedding dresses and planning all that, fine, because you're inside. A controlled environment. The outside, all bets are off. I'm done. Okay. On my suggestion, I've read I don't know how many textbooks and landscaping books. They're all about the same. And that's one thing that I, I kind of a little bit take pride in that I don't come across with the same approach they do. I approach it from a different standpoint. With almost with, this is one exception. Almost with no exceptions on any of the uh, landscape design books, either the first or certainly by the second chapter, they got a whole chapter on color theory. And they'll go, blah, 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 you know. And then they want to, you know, and then the engineering comes out, oh, we got to plot this all out in graph paper. And I've sat in a lot of those different classrooms and, and for they're going to have a landscape design class. As soon as they bring out the graph paper, you can, I can watch around the room and the switch goes click. This is a nice approach. I've, uh, I've talked to Janet several times, emailed her, but I think she's got an excellent approach. It's about 11 or 12 bucks. It's not an expensive book. So if you want to go with like a, somebody to kind of lead you through the steps, excellent book. And she kind of says this, her description of color, she says, you know, like most people are pretty good about dressing themselves. You know, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, you can kind of color, color coordinate enough to go out the, out the door. All right, so why, why should you look, you know, I'm just a clod kicker from Dirt Ranch, Iowa. You know, why should you be listening to me? You know, well, you know, I can say this is the site of my house. I mean, I'm in Walcott. I'm right on the edge of the prairie. You can see out there. If you can see for miles. And, uh, but anyway, this is 2003, and that's what I started out with. And that was just hard, compacted. Oh, it was nasty. But uh, anyway, this is shortly what it became. That's a picture of my house now. Now, I'm not a purist. You know, I'll, I'll use a lot, of, I, more and more native plants all the time. The percentage is certainly going up. But I'll use other plants. Uh, some of them were existing ones that I had. But I, I'm a big believer in the native plants, and that's what I use extensively. But I'll mix them, and I'll also use, I'll have an example here later with a, like of a shooting star where I'm using some of the horticulture plants to uh, really show off the native plants. And it's kind of that major character, minor character, you know, theater thing. We'll come up on that. Just another view. This, well, 
I kind of like the bugs too. We were celebrating Mother's Day one year, and so that was a big sign I ordered. And uh, my neighbor later came over, and well, she's affectionately called the crazy lady in my neighborhood. But anyway, God bless her, you know. But she, Dan, what is what, what is that Mother's Day? And I explained it to her. We're going to have a look at moths. We're going to put up a white sheet and and see what comes to them with the black light. You really are a a weirdo, aren't you? She said, you're just a geek. And I said, so I thought, well, that, from her, that was a compliment. I said, yeah, I guess so, you know. So anyway, but that was, we celebrated. But and anyway, what I try and do is I, this was another excuse for me to invite people to my home, to my landscape. And while you're there, what do we look at? We look at native plants. So I try and reel them in there, too. One book that would be an excellent one to have in your library is probably most of you need another book, uh, you know. But, but anyway, uh, and with this Thomas Rayner, uh, I email him occasionally. He also has a wonderful blog. But that's a book I kind of recommend. Uh, he gets it, and he's into a lot of native plants, and also he's into using the natives because it's not as much work. And here's one thing they won't tell you in the, in the landscape design books. Good landscape design reduces your workload. And you, re you try and design it to eliminate the repetitive chores. I don't mind doing the work up front, but I have this stupid stuff where I'm out there, you know, doing weed pulling and weed whipping and everything, you know, in the middle of August, you know, with, you know, that's nuts. You know, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to enjoy my, my landscape. And good design eliminates those problems. Here's this Thomas Rainer. It's from you. He's got a, you can look it up online. It's called Grounded Design. It's a blog that he has. And Thomas, like I said, gets it. And here's the mistake that a lot of us do. We try and get it like a seed mix with, with all the different seeds in it. We sprinkle it you know, out there and see what comes up. But he's saying nature should be interpreted, not imitated. In other words, I had a different way. It's what I say that in an, to, in an urban environment, you want to capture the highlights of the prairie. In other words, you're, the thing is, you're never going to recreate a prairie. In, uh, on a, certainly, not, I've got a regular residential sized lot. The thing that makes a prairie a prairie, really, is, you know, and they always talked about this in, in, in the diaries of the settlers going across the country. They talked about the vastness. And the way, you know, grass is, you know, waving like waves on the ocean. There's nothing vast about my landscape. Ain't going to happen. And probably for most of you, is you don't have a 40-acre landscape either. But so in other words, we have to do things a little bit differently. We have to, instead of, you, you need to capture highlights of the prairie and put those into your, into your landscape without trying to reproduce a prairie because you just simply don't have enough room. Here's an example of capturing the essence, entirely different. I mean, this is, uh, this is obviously a woman, but she, does she give you the impression of a tigress? You know, she does. But it, it, she's capturing the highlights, and she's, you know, showing those off. Um, to me, this, this says prairie to me. I mean, I just, I love that photo. It's a simple photo. But on some of the prairie plants, especially some of the taller ones, and, of course, a lot of the, the the advice you get, oh, don't play anything too tall. And that's what people will tell me. Oh, well, if you're going to recommend, but don't give me anything too tall. And what I say, that's exactly what's wrong with your garden. You don't have anything with its height. You need something. Now, it doesn't have to be height and be like a, a big pine tree and block out the entire view. And that's really what they're saying, but they don't really understand it. What, I like tall stuff that, are, that I can see through. This is certainly one. Something like white baptisia is another one, not blue, which really isn't our native for this, uh, this state. But the white, it gets you know, pretty tall, but it looks like a big candelabra, and, but you can see through it. But it just adds a delightful element. It gives you that height, but it doesn't block the view. And that's, that's the trick with using tall stuff. I know all the advice, oh, yeah, well, you small in front, and then you know, stair step it up. You don't have to do that if you use see-through plants. And they add that pizzazz. It add that main character on the stage kind of thing. So now then capturing, now, you know, I do, I've been doing this for several years, and I just never took a picture of my own. But here they're planting some native plants in pots. They captured the highlights. 
and I think those are little blue stem, and they put them in pots, and I've done that, and they look wonderful. I've used that in like Rattlesnake Master. It can be simple, but it just, it says prairie. I bring it in there with a pretty pot, and uh, I've captured it, and it certainly says prairie. Um, here's Rainer again saying, to achieve the same effect in the smaller garden, we have to use more of the same species and in higher density. Some people call this putting and planting in drifts, that's a little bit, I'll show you some examples of some, they would, I guess, qualify for drifts, but not like most people think. But you want, um, here's an example of like in situ. This is prairie drop seed, one of my favorite grasses, one of the prettiest grasses. But it doesn't, you know, I mean, by itself, it, yeah, it's okay. Now to the plant, you know, us plant geeks, I mean, we love it, you know, we, you know, but for my neighbor, doesn't mean anything. I don't even know what it is. You know, and here's another a little bit later and see it's dried up. They like that. Same plant. What I've done is I've planted a increased the density, and that's all I got. I don't, it's kind of a monoculture in there. But uh, now that frames, and this is one my main rain garden. You'll see at the very end how behind this what it looks like. But uh, and a nice crisp edge. But anyway, that defines it and it what I'm using that for is to frame everything else, okay? And here they're mixing a few things in. This is uh, the pale purple coneflower. The other one that works really good here is really all any of the uh, liatris, you know, with the tall, tall spiky, you know, and they just, they got a real nice impact. Um, but that, if you want to mix stuff in there, you can. Um, but in an urban setting, we want to avoid creating a wasp. Okay, what's a wasp, you say? It's a wild and scary prairie. <laughs> okay? It, don't, it, it ain't going to fly in, in an urban setting. So, I mean, here's, here's a picture of a wasp. This is, it happens to be in Davenport. This was a city project. And that sign did not used to be there. But the city decided to put it up after they got so many phone calls. And just about imagine what that phone call said. When are you going to cut? So... And I was there when uh, they had the Master Gardeners help plant that thing. And they had some uh, landscape design architect. Remember his last name was Lafleur, And he had credentials, you know, up his, uh. And, oh, it'll be wonderful. Uh, because it's native plants. And native plants are beautiful. So, of course, it'll be beautiful. Well, how do you want to plant? Oh, just put them anywhere out there and mix them up. And you know, diversity is one. It, it'll be great. Yeah, well... I mean, I can go there and I can identify the plants in there, but most everybody else driving by said, <laughs> you need some Roundup here. <laughs> is that what we want? I mean, as native plant enthusiasts, is that what we want to accomplish? To, in other words, tick off everybody in town because we think native plants are cool? No, I want them to like them. I want them to enjoy them. If I got to do things differently, if I got to actually incorporate some design, I will. And coincidentally, most of these plants are in my rain gardens. It's just the difference is I designed it. I didn't do the scrambled eggs. How are we doing on time here? I'm gonna, okay, we better pick it up. Uh, this is a little rain garden I, that I put. This was a demonstration plant. I hated the, I took a, a plant off the internet with their seed, or I mean their plant selection. I thought it was, I really had to bite my tongue, but this was for a workshop we did at my house. And uh, anyway, it said to plant Maximilian sunflowers. And of course, any, anybody who reads any gardening articles knows that you always planted threes, so I planted three Maximilian sunflowers. Here it was that fall. <laughs> okay? Now I'm about six foot tall, and everybody, oh, you photoshopped. No, I did not photoshop that. But I mean, so. Just because it's a native plant, you might not want to plant that. I would say do not plant with that one in your garden. Uh, on the back 40, we're slugging it out with everything else. Fine. Okay. Yeah, avoid that. But anyway, what I like to do is it's not as important in life, you know, what you do is how you do it. So what I did, I took those, and we were having, and my friend of ours, she has a, an old corn uh, crib. She turned into her, calls it her corn zebo. And she has parties there. We had an Oktoberfest, so I made her a, you know, hanging a flower arrangement for her front door. Just a few tips we'll throw in here real quick. 
edge your sidewalks. I mean, I don't care what kind of garden you want, edge them before and it just it makes a big difference. Uh, tip two, edge your beds. Uh, it does make a difference. And I'm showing just different ways to do it. And a special note, you can be asking, what in the world is mowing and trimming and edging have to do with native plants? You got to remember that the majority of public acceptability takes place on the subconscious level. That, and it does make a difference as far as like trimming and that. If the public sees something that is neat and orderly, they can accept it. They may not really like what you did, but they can accept it. But if all they see is a mess, and of course, a classic example, all of his native plant enthusiasts should know, they usually recommend at least mow a strip around whatever you got so it looks like it's not forgotten about and that it's intentional. But that, you know, if you just go around and edge your beds and that, it, it, believe me, it does a world of difference on the public acceptance at a subconscious level of whether they like your place or not. It's a powerful tool that far too few people use. Because, well, once again, I think that's part of landscape design they never talk about in the books, you know, the textbooks. Okay, get rid of worn out plants. I mean, you know, and boy, here's a great opportunity to get rid of, you know, plant some natives, you know. Yank them suckers out of there and get rid of them. Uh, and of course, why, put something like this, go to dogwood. That's one of our native dogwood. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean, it's just, it's a wonderful plant. You know, that's the kind of stuff we should be planting. Uh, and it's okay to cut down a tree. You know, you don't, just because it's there doesn't mean, I mean, come on, we can, we can, you know, improve. And, and of course, call your local favorite tree crew. Uh, see that? Uh, look at that guy up there. Oh. So make sure your insurance, your liability is paid up. And, and of course, I'm sure they're bonded and licensed, you know, so. But anyway, I don't know where, I, that was when I robbed off the internet somewhere. I will show you one where I do know. It was right across a house when I lived. I used to have a house in Davenport. And I lived, and every morning I'd get up and look out my bedroom window, and this is what I'd see across the street. I'd see this, na whoopsie, yeah, well, that's sorry. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, this nasty old tree, and when the house sold, they did a few other things like siding that, but the first, one of the first things they did, thank God, was tear down that nasty old tree. It was, everybody's afraid to cut, oh, I don't want to cut down a tree. Oh, come on. You know, you can improve. You can do something better. But here, I think that looks tremendously better. And, you know, take that poor thing out of its misery. <laughs> okay, but don't plant, oh, I got a silver maple because, you know, it was cheap and it gives me quick shade. Yeah, well, you know, I'll guarantee you, you spent more money fixing your lawnmower that you tore up on them suckers. They do not belong in a landscape. You know, they, they, where you normally find them growing is in, like along the river, there's all kinds of them along the Mississippi River, real close. But the roots come up to the surface because they're used to growing in wet environments. And roots require air. Most people don't realize that, but they do. And they're coming up for air. And I don't care if you fill that in, you know, with topsoil in short order, they'll be right at the surface again. So, but, oh, it's a native plant. Oh, come on. Right plant, right place. Okay. Tip five, never plant a tree in your yard. I said this at a Trees Forever conference one day. I thought they were going to kill me. <laughs> but anyway, I quickly had to explain, plant it in a bed. And here's like an example of what I, this is in my yard. And that happens to be, a, oh, it's a crab apple one called, it's a cultivar called uh, curry fire. Uh, and now, but see, it doesn't show up here. But I keep crisp edges in my beds and that, uh, and other areas that are more defined. But you know, that's for a lot of people, that'd be pretty rangy. But I think it's beautiful myself. Is that mulch what you have on the up there? A little bit, right there. But I don't do, what I do when I first plant this stuff, I do mulch. And then what I try and do is have it planted thickly enough where I don't really worry about mulch. If I, if I need mulch, I'll throw a handful where it's needed, and that's pretty much it. I don't, you know, that's a lot of waste. That's, once again, one of the repetitive things. Or as the British like to define, they call American garden, typical American garden, is a mulch garden with a few plants scattered about. <laughs> you know, well, come on. Yeah, you know, no, I'm, I'm going to plant some, plant something. You know, and also with it, with your plant, have we plant a lot of different things? It stages itself in. I've always got something in bloom. I mean, from now here for 
several weeks now I've had some stuff already bloom and it'll bloom until almost Christmas. So, you know, some things. But, and, but it's stages, you know. It's not all going all the time, you know. But and here's just another view. This was where we kind of were looking over here. And this is a swamp white oak, which is one of our native plants. And that's in a bed. And this is the late fall, early spring. Now, all my daffies, I plant King Alfred. It's just loaded with full of daffies. And then also I plant in Canadian anemones in there, which take over after the um, daffies, you know, senes. Senes means die back and dry. Um, but they make a wonderful ground cover and really choke everything else out. So that's really a, essentially a native plant bed. Uh, but I protect it. Anybody know how long the average lifespan of a tree, urban tree is? It's five to seven years. That's it. Why is it mostly it's lawnmowers running into them, damage them, or string trim or blight, they call it. But they ruin them and they get disease in them and they die. But on average, they say it's... But if you, the best way to protect it, rather than a mulch volcano, plant some panel bed around it. And guess what? It don't take me long to mow that little patch. So what I've done, I've eliminated a lot of my maintenance. And also, I've designed them so, you know what, my lawnmower will go right along that edge. I don't have to weed whip nothing. All right. Or you can, that's, that's the best looking red, that's a redbud tree in my little hometown of Walcott. That's about, I've stepped it off, it's like 80 feet across. It's huge. Yeah, it's impressive. And new people bought it. They were going to, first going to mo cut it down, and I mean the neighborhood went unglued. <laughs> Thought we were ready to beat the guy in the head. He didn't know what he had, you know. Bought it in the winter. And anyway, tip six, uh, use fencing with a purpose. I think that's a good purpose for a fence. <laughs> you got to realize, I'm an old farm boy, and when it comes to fences, I'm thinking cattle and hogs, and then eh, I don't want to fence. I don't want to fence off my garden to keep everybody out. I want people to come look at it. So, I mean, it's a personal opinion, and I realize there's a place for fences. I understand that, you know, children and all this and that. But uh, anyway, well, here's another good place for it. You know, you can kind of keep the neighborhood good, you know. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, but fencing, I mean, the question is, do you really need it? Maybe all you need is a sign. You know, you don't need fence at all. You know, just a, on a tilted general, we've been an espresso and a free puppy, so. But, uh, but anyway, here's what I chose to do, and there are, I use fencing, just because I need some fence, some fence, maybe I only need a section or two. I don't have to, you know, it's one, also one thing that I call a perimeter paralysis. In other words, people think that they always have to go all the way around a perimeter or something. Perimeter of their yard, perimeter of their, Garage, the house. Oh, we got a perimeter around a tree. That's go, you, know, you just got to get out of that box. And what I, I'll show you what I did. Like here, I'm building this patio, and um, I just use a section because this is this is about a, like a three foot drop or so. Well, and there's uh, French doors or sliders. Well, I don't want somebody coming out of my sunroom, walking out there and falling three feet onto the the concrete pavers. That you know, I need something there. So the fencing is the answer, but I don't need to fence the entire yard. I just need that area. So, I mean, this is what I did. I worked with deer, like I said, I've worked with, you know, in heavy industry all my life with steel and stuff. This is some scrap from deer, and some guys thought it was absolutely nuts. What do you want that crap for? And I said, well, you know, so I, I knew what I was gonna do with it, build a fence, but, um, and I'll show you, and then I had my brother come and help me put it, we welded up panels of it. And then I put those up, and then we painted them. And this is my, uh, the finished uh, patio is coming down. One thing I've got, I don't have any steps in the house. I've got, my, my house has no steps to get into. And it's all handicap accessible. I don't, none of us are handicapped. But I always remember my grandmother when she was, you know, older. She'd always say, well, can we take you here, Grandma? Well, no, I can't get in. Well, I wanted Grandma or anybody else. If you come to Danny's house, I want you to come in. So I don't have any steps, so that's what I did there. Danny, what's the white? Is that what? permeable? Uh, it is a little bit permeable, yeah. There is some through it. Uh, that, this white thing, that's just a... No, the bushes. 
Oh, these are uh, Pinstemon. That's a uh, Fox Club Pinstemon, yeah. One I really recommend. They bloom a long time. They always look great. They kind of stick up a little bit taller than most of the other plants, and you can see through them. And they're just bulletproof, okay? And, of course, you know, here's the fence. Of course, the kids uh, when have a party. They like to sit on here. and, and uh, So, anyway, one thing also that's very effective in landscape design is repetition of elements. Here I'm just showing some rocks. This is when you first come up to my house. This is around the corner. This is another view of it. This was the, the two areas. But I'm repeating that. On a subconscious level, it works. You know, they may not even realize it, but I do that a number of places. Uh, here, we were looking over here before, and here's my third rain garden. Um, and here in the back on that patio area, I also have one of those same stones. I think they call them karst. It's like, I, it's limestone that looks like Swiss cheese. Okay. But anyway, so I've repeated that a number of times. In other words, it gives some continuity to the place. And you do the same thing with plants. Okay, the, I also replay uh, fencing panels, and I have one around the corner, which is along the side of my, my garage, and then I have a compass plant planted there. One of the reasons I plant the compass plants are in the silphiums, because they will self sow like a banshee, and I want to I deadhead them. I mean, you've got to realize that when you plant it, because they'll, uh, you know, they'll self sow. And I really don't want to be pulling, you know, a bunch of compass plants out, so I'll deadhead them as they go along. But it's a nice little uh, added thing on the corner of the fence. And of course, Culver's root back here and a bunch of other stuff in that. Uh, repetition of plants. And of course, here the, all that advice that's repeated ad nauseum. You know, well, we repeat it because, well, I read it somewhere. I always plant in groups of three. If you're going to buy, oh, three. You saw the three Maximilian sunflowers. Well, here's a generally my, my opinion of that advice that you read every year, time and time again. Uh, that's what I think of that <laughs> advice, okay? Here's what I, my rule of planting is, is plant three flats, okay? I, in other words, quantity, with mass, we, a little more density. However, as a side benefit, usually if you buy three flats of something, you don't quite have enough room for that area. So what do you do? Well, you start looking around other areas you can snick it into. And guess what? You snick a few here, a few here, a few there, but you've given that repetition of elements. Okay. Here's just an, here's one where they're not. They're using a pretty good density. These aren't all native plants. This happens to be at a uh, hospital in Bettendorf, Iowa, in Quad Cities. But I really think they did a nice job on this land. It's very simple. A lot of density. There are a bunch of native plants on the other end, and some of the sumacs and that in there. But uh, you know, I think that's nice. In, in other words. And there's not a lot of different species there. And that's one of the things that helps, you know, we've concentrated it, we've captured the highlight. Okay? And we're highlighting that element. Here's another one where we've got, it's a little bit looser arrangement, you know, but we've masked, you know, you know, some of the black eyed Susan, and whatever, and then some of the asters are squared. And I don't know, this is one I just got off the internet. I, I love this. I thought this was a nice view. Here's another one where also they're showing the height. I've always noticed in my garden, whenever I have some of this stuff, like, and that I'm sure is prairie dock. I have a, one prairie dock off of my uh, patio in the back, and, and when it's in bloom, you know, and of course you're looking up at the bloom. You know, they're 10, 12 feet tall. And, uh, and of course I deadhead them. But um, people love it. Oh, man, what, you know, what is, that's another wild plant. What's that white flower in the bottom right? Uh, bottom right. Oh, that's, that's, I'm sure, in Echinacea. That's uh, probably one of them out of uh, Chicago Botanical Gardens. It's the, one of the white swan, I think they call it. It's a horticultural one. I, you know, I don't, this is another photo I took off the Internet. I'm just kind of giving it as an example, you know. It's not, once again, I'm not a purist, but, I mean, I, I certainly lean heavily towards them. And I, I'm not saying I would use these same plants. I probably wouldn't. That looks like maybe a blue baptisia which I, I plant the white one, not the blue one. Here's one of my little, you know, my fire hydrant. You know, what do you do with a fire hydrant? No, I'm not going to make it a nutcracker, you know, paint. You know, but what I do, I try and just develop a little fire theme. Down in the bottom, you really can't see it here, but there's a bunch of prairie smoke that blooms here in the spring. Smoke, fire, okay. <laughs> and then uh, behind it is a crab apple tree named Prairie Fire, 
This is a goldenrod. This is a cultivar called fireworks. This, you know, I mean, solid dagos are native. That's not a native cultivar, but I'm cheating there a little bit. I'm trying to, but I'm trying to have a little fun with the fire. But obviously, the New England asters and some of the other ones in there are all native. Uh, here's it in Wichita, Kansas, the Children's Garden. Delightful place. If you haven't been there, I really recommend it. Uh, in other words, just a very simple planting. Uh, and, you know, the blue grandma grass. Some people call it eyelash grass. I think it's just, just, I was really captivated by it. Here's one also my favorite, one of our native plants. In Great Britain, any gardening center worth its salt has bunches of them on the shelf. Have you seen it in any of our garden centers? Do any of you have it in your yard? That is a spectacular plant. When you take it in a garden setting, it really, well, what it does, it just goes nuts. I mean, it, in a good way. I mean, it really, its attributes are just amplified. And, um, usually found in woodland settings, damper, a little bit shady, but it will take full sun just fine. I grow it in full sun, too. Uh, I've experimented a lot with these plants in different settings to see whether, you know, how they respond. But that's one you should... Had. That's another wild plant. People look at that and, wow, what's that? And so, and what I encourage you to do is, you know, if you've got these native plants in there, nobody else has seen them. And nobody, you know, they don't know what they are. And it's our job, if we truly love these things, let's expose people to it. And what, you know, I mean, how do you, you know, even when they first come up, God, isn't that gorgeous? Uh, is there a better looking blue than that? Here's our, like a little trout lilies, you know, just spectacular with the little leaves that look like a speckled trout. And, of course, the trilliums. Here's the shooting stars. Remember I talked about, like, uh, highlighting uh, the native plants with some horticulturals? And, like, this is one called green spice. It used to be called echo improved, but that's a, really a stunner as far as a, uh, creating a scene, a backdrop. Uh, it is virtually evergreen. It all, you know, I whack it back in the spring, and then it comes back out, and it looks like that all year long. But uh, it really highlights my shooting stars. You know, that's one way that I, you know, I choose to do it. And of course, bloodroot. And it always amazes me. I never, I've never ever got a good picture of bloodroot because it's so white. I, it just, you know, blows my camera out out of the water. Uh, and of course, ruin it. You know, some of these, a lot of these are spring ephemerals. I'm going to kind of get through some of these here. And one of my favorites, purple coneflower, which is, I mean, everybody talks about, oh, the purple coneflower. Well, now this is what's really native to Iowa, further east, damper. And even the tap roots, if you look at this, this has a tap root. The regular cone, purple coneflower has root, a root ball. I call it cespitos. But uh, anyway, I love this one. If nothing else, plant this. It blooms a couple weeks earlier than the purple coneflower, so it extends your season of bloom. But I think that it's just so delicate and, and feminine and pretty. I just love that flower. Um, and, of course, Michigan lilies. I, I mean, good God, how do you beat that? And there's quite a few of them out there, usually a damper locations. Uh, a lot of times I find them damper locations along uh, railroad tracks, you know, but I've, I, I've particularly one spot where there's, I know thousands of cars drive past it every day and they've never, they don't even know they're there. And there's a one clump of probably 500, you know. And I'm talking plants, not blo blooms. There's probably well over a thousand blooms. But just what a gorgeous plant. Native. How many of you have seen it? You know? Yeah. But it, it, you don't see it a lot. There's, there's more out there than what I thought. And of course, the wild rose. And originally they call it Rosa, what, Pratincola, and now it's called Arcanza. One problem I always have with it, they hybridize. And I don't, you know, it's, to me it's a wild rose, and I, you know, trying to say that's what it is. Well, I, you know, I'm not so confident, at least in my ability. But it's our state flower, uh, way back in 1897. But the story. What I encourage people to do is develop and find out the stories that are associated with these individual plants. Once again, I'm always trying to address that subconscious level. And in one re way, too, I, as a man, I'm trying to address, I'm trying to bring the women in, because a lot of times the women make the decisions more than the men do, and especially at, at this level. And the thing that, that's wonderful about 
the uh, wild rose in the state of Iowa, other than being our state flower, is how it became our state flower. <coughs> As the country is being developed, of course, there were more of the aristocracy lived in the East. And the women were really considered chattel. You know, they were just property. <coughs> but as they moved out here into the, the Midwest and, you know, settled further west, uh, women were treated entirely differently. They were, they were a necessity. If you were going to survive out here, buddy, you better have, you know, was, your, your odds were a lot better if you had a woman with you because she had skills that you didn't. And it's, it's a well-established fact that in the early settlements, it's the women who made more money than the men. A lot of them by cooking and cleaning and sewing and whatever, but they had skills that the men didn't have and needed. And also, they, you know, when you were trying to make it, you know, establish a homestead, you, it was a joint effort. And she certainly wasn't, you know, a bobble. You know, she was a vital part of your of your family, of your home. And so we considered women differently. So anyway, when the men were having their big to do at the at the Senate you know, up at the, in. Des Moines trying to figure out, you know, they wanted to have a state flower. They were, you know, arguing about it and they couldn't come to a decision. And somebody said, hey, you know what, we, we ought to really consult the women on this. So what they did, there happened to be a, like a federation, state federation of women's clubs that would have a meeting in Des Moines, so from, or in Dubuque. So they contacted the women and said, hey, ladies, what do you think? You know, what should we have here? And they came back and they said, they wanted the wild rose. Now, of course, the question is, which rose? Essentially all of them. And we kind of think that it was what they intended, but they just said wild rose. So any of the, and there's what, like seven maybe in the state, different kinds of wild rose. So anyway, what we did, the men were tipping their hat to the women, deferring to them, including them in the decisions, which was unheard of out east. So what it is, to me, the wild rose really symbolizes the men's appreciation of women in the state of Iowa. So I think that belongs in our gardens. And I think that story deserves to be repeated. And uh, so anyway, what have we got here? Oh, yeah. And then is this, you know, this is back, you know, early days. Some guy even, it was a pretty long, long poem, but the final stanza is, Let others sing of mountain snows or palms beside the sea. The state whose emblem is the rose is fairest far to me. You know, so anyway, I mean, they really, they really, I guess we're trying to suck up to the women on that one. I don't know. But anyway, but that's, you know, I think that should be in our, our, you know, in all the rose gardens I see. And I, to me, this is a pretty flower. When I look at all those other roses with all the other pet, I, these got so many petal stuff in them. To me, I look at it, it looks like a bucket of dew worms. I, you know, I'm, I like that simple, beautiful, you know, wild rose. The others, you can't even see like the stamens or anything. Ugh, I mean, you know. So anyway, celebrate the moments. I have every fall, I have a little hay rack ride for the neighborhood kids. I invite the neighbors over. And guess what? Most of the prairie plants, you know, they, they bloom, use tend to later in the year. Of course, the spring ephemerals don't. But, but I have a little party over there. And the kids are running around, and we're looking at bugs and plants and and we get to like the jewel weeds, or the, some people call them the touch me nots, where they, you know they touch them and then like the sh you know the seed shoots out. And you want to hear a bunch of kids just squealing with delight, you know, and they just they're looking for every one they can possibly find. But it's a native plant, and guess what? They're, they're not going to forget that. So, but I, I celebrate the fact that hey, I got native plants, and I ain't going to find many else, many others in, in you know the town. But it is a, it's a matter of perspective, you know. I asked my dad for a Corliss drill one day, and this is what he handed me, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, it is perspective. But, but anyway, how others see is not as important. It's how you see yourself that really means everything. I see myself as a guy who loves and embraces the native plants that our foref forefathers grew up with. And uh, so... You know, I think it's important. Uh, here's a picture of my rain garden, my biggest rain garden, my first one. And I just did burn it off. And this is about what it looks like right now. One thing I will mention, I noticed here, uh, 
And here they're showing a bunch of daffodils just coming up. I took them out of that berm because a problem with daffodils is that the leaves take so long to die back. And, for, and, and some of the, the tall ones that everybody thinks of when you say daffodil, they're King Alfred is usually what they're, they're thinking of. But they're a late season bloomer. And what I have gone to now are, are the little short miniature ones that bloom real early and the other stuff will grow up above it and, and hide it. But anyway, I dug those all out and got rid of them. So one thing to keep in mind. But here is my, uh, also that Carex, whoopsie. Well, that's what it turns into. This is the Carex muscingimensis. Those are native, well, with the exception, these are wave petunias, but I planted those. Those grow there all year long, or they did at that, I changed them up. But at that time, I wanted something that the public could identify with. Also, you know, before that's in bloom, it's, it looks a little rangy. So I wanted public acceptance. I didn't want my neighbors ticked off. And